Good afternoon uh, to everyone and welcome to this IIEA webinar from Dublin. We're delighted uh, to be joined today by Dr. Anis uh, Marin, a researcher at the University of Warsaw and an associate fellow with Chatham House, who is um, an expert on Belarus. I'll introduce Dr. Marin in a moment. She will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and we will then go to a question and answer session with our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And you can send in your questions uh, throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them, or at least to as many as possible in the time that we have once Dr. Moran has finished her presentation. Um, both today's presentation and the Q&A are on the record. You can also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Dr. Anais, Anais Marin is a French political scientist who specializes in international relations, Eurasian and border studies. For the past decade, her main research focus has been on Belarus, Belarusian domestic and foreign policies, first as an expert with the Finnish Institute for International Affairs, and then as Marie Curie uh, Fellow with Collegium Civitas uh, in Warsaw, where she conducted comparative research on diplomacy as a tool for authoritarian regime survival in post-Soviet Eurasia. Since 2018, she is affiliated with the Center for French Culture at the University of Warsaw, where she pilots a project on Russia's sharp power. Dr. Moran is an associate fellow at Chatham House, working on uh, its Russia and Eurasia program. So over to you, Dr. Moran, uh, to address us on the topic of Belarus in the new European disorder, challenges for the EU. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thank you for the invitation. Um, Russia's attack on Ukraine, which is, um, has shaken the world order, creates a security challenge uh, for the EU, among others due to the risk of escalation. As we know, any border incident could drag NATO into the conflict and, and result in, uh, in a World War II, uh, World War III. Sorry. This new European disorder is multifaceted. The war has caused a refugee crisis, uh, energy crisis, looming global food crisis. It is also a trust crisis because the war is also one of world visions and governance models and subsequently of com competing narratives. And we see that disinformation plays a great role as part of a wider set of so-called reflexive control measures that Russia is an uh, expert in. Uh, Belarus, which is a close political and military ally of Russia, plays a pivotal role in this setting. Yet I believe that due to a number of factors, which I'll try to highlight today, there is a possibility to turn this challenge into an opportunity for the EU. Um, it goes without saying that the Republic of Belarus has played an enabling role in Russia's uh, unjustified and unprovoked aggression against Ukraine. And hence, it is labeled as a co-aggressor and legitimately so. I would like to stress, however, that it is not a co-belligerent. There are no Belarusian boots on the ground except those of uh, volunteers who joined the Ukrainian side, in, in fact. And my main argument is that while the Lukashenko regime should be seen as an accomplice in this crime and face the consequences of it up to criminal liability, it is important to try and decouple Belarus from Russia and especially the Belarusian people from its leadership. Because in fact, one Belarus itself is being occupied a process of soft annexation has uh, been going on for a couple of years, resulting in a deeper integration with Russia, which has led Belarus to almost abandon its sovereignty over the past years. This is the line of argument adopted by the Belarusian opposition in exile, which immediately contested the legitimacy of Lukashenko's support for Russia's war, since he is not himself a legitimate president. Uh, since 2020, his last contested re-election in the uh, 9th of August, but even we could say since 1999, when he unduly stayed in power uh, after a um, constitutional 
coup. Second, we cannot exclude that Belarus could lose its sovereignty altogether, and its subjugation may well be one of the Kremlin's objectives in today's war. Um, this would shake even more the European security order, adding over 1,000 kilometers of direct land border between Russia and NATO countries, Poland and Lithuania, which Russia considers as hostile, unlike Finland, for example. And three, the current limbo exacerbates a very long lasting dilemma for the West, that sanctions against the Lukashenko regime push Belarus further into Russia's embrace. However, I believe it also offers the EU an opportunity to overcome it and solve its Belarus problem in the process. This Belarus problem in a, in a nutshell is that formally um, Belarus chose formal neutrality, it's inscripted in, it, in the 1994 constitution, for lack of better, because as a resource-less transit country sandwiched between Russia and the EU, and because also of its historical aversion for war, which is a heritage of World War II, um, Belarus has tried to, uh, to be seen as neutral. However, it is highly dependent on Russia for its economic survival and security, and also given that its autocratic leader's priority is regime survival. So Lukashenko over the past two decades has engaged in what was called the balancing act of, on the one side, blackmailing Russia and bargaining with the West so as to maintain the status quo and his personal power. And this geopolitical shopping has been balancing uh, also EU policy towards uh, Belarus for many years. The blackmailing meant pretending to agree to deeper integration with Russia, meaning signing treaties that it never implemented, while at the same time threatening to lean westwards in order to get more subsidies from, from Russia, usually in the forms of hydrocarbons at discount prices, military equipment meant to help Belarus defend the western flank of the Union state. And all this opportunistic tactic meant to raise the bidding of his fleeting loyalty. The bargaining side of, um, of this geopolitical shopping is, was in relation with the West trying to trade off the political prisoners that Mr. Lukashenko keeps uh, jailing and promising reforms uh, that were never implemented so as to obtain an easing or a lifting of uh, sanctions which have been imposed on his regime more or less uh, constantly since 1996. So the, the goal was to try and convince the West to accept his regime as it is, always reminding that the more isolated it would be from the West, the more vulnerable it would be to Russian appetites. This is what I called uh, diktaplomatic tactics. This had a disastrous effect on the coherence of the EU's Eastern neighborhood policies because uh, most of this strategy relied on build, building on in, internal EU divisions. For example, after, Georgia, um, after the Georgian Russian war of 2008, Belarus was invited to join the Eastern partnership even though it did not meet the democratic conditionality standards. After the annexation of Crimea, Sanctions were lifted in 2015-2016, even though there had been no genuine progress towards democracy. Those political prisoners who were liberated uh, at the time as a sign of goodwill had already served most of their sentence in jail. And um, the fact that two opposition candidates uh, entered parliament in 2016 had very little impact given that the parliament has almost no power in Belarus. So the challenge in my view is for the EU to try and make its own policy towards Belarus more coherent. Um, and indeed sanctions were reinstated in August, 2020 in response to electoral fraud and repression. New packages were added after the Ryanair incident on 23rd of May last year. And following the um, hybrid attack, or so was it labeled by, by Poland of uh, Belarus uh, against the EU when it's engineered a migrant crisis at EU borders. Um, the, in this um, uh, blackmail, the neutrality of Belarus, so situation and neutrality plays a key role. Uh, constitutionally, um, this was the case, um, but 
Belarus has bandwagoned into several Russia-led security alliances, such as the um, uh, CSTO, but also and more importantly in the Union State, which has a strong military and defense uh, component. However, Belarus refused monetary union and um, declined, uh, well, resisted Russia's claims for opening uh, military bases, notably uh, an air base on its territory. But since his last contested re-election uh, in August 2020, Lukashenko has had no choice but to make, to put in the very concessions that he had successfully withheld previously and accept this deeper integration. And as a result, in February 2022, we can say that uh, the situation neutrality has ended. SNAP joint exercises named Union Resolve were being held uh, from 10th to 20th of February with a massive presence of Russian troops. And um, Belarus arguably asked Russians to stay after the exercises, after the end of the drills, due to heightened security threats. Lukashenko's rhetoric was that Belarus needed Russian protection against the risk of an aggression from Ukraine. <clears throat> His um, country played an enabling role in the attack. Russian troops from there moved to take Chernobyl and try and encircle Kiev in the first days of the war. Belarusian territory has served as an outpost uh, for Russian airstrikes and fighter jets have been taking off from military and even civilian airfields in Belarus. And in the first six weeks of the war, at least 600 missile launches took places from Belarusian territory, hitting military and civilian targets in Ukraine. And finally, Belarus served as a support back base for supplies, extraction of Ukrainian war prisoners, of wounded Russian soldiers who are treated in Belarusian hospitals for training. There are supposedly mercenary training centers in the, uh, the southern part of uh, Belarus for the for the Ukrainian uh, for the Russian uh, side, and it even supported the looting process by shipping uh, to Russia the uh, fr the from the Belarusian post those um, goods that were looted in in Ukraine. But the rest, the support to the Russian aggressor is also visible in other dimensions. I would highlight that uh, three days after the start of the war on 27th of February, Belarus held a constitutional referendum which included amending Article 18, which previously re read that Belarus sets the goal of making its territory a nuclear-free zone and its state a neutral one. This um, article was deleted and replaced by Belarus excludes that a military aggression from its territory be launched against other states. And as we know, this has been violated um, uh, even before the new constitution was adopted. There are other articles uh, that were added in the constitution on ideology, which seemed to be also a concession to, uh, to Mr. Putin personally, and his uh, Russian world uh, ideology based on the celebration of the Great Patriotic War, of, um, for example, a new article reads that the manifestation of patriotism and the preservation of the historical memory of the heroic past of the Belarusian people is the duty of every citizen of the Republic of Belarus. And Belarus also plays a role in this disinformation war. It copycatted the narrative that Russia is conducting a military operation to denazify Ukraine and that the Ukrainian regime is a puppet in the hands of Washington that NATO intended to expand to, to Ukraine and is thus uh, co-responsible for the launch of the war. And in the UN, finally, Belarus voted against the UN, um, uh, the General Assembly resolutions alongside four other countries um, notably the resolution of 2nd of March, uh, entitled Aggression Against Ukraine, which contains a paragraph in which the General Assembly, I quote, deplores the involvement of Belarus in this unlawful use of force against Ukraine and calls upon it to abide by its international obligations. The, the resolution was adopted nonetheless with a historical 141 majority votes, while only 35 countries abstained, including China. Um, this notion is based on the definition of aggression in international law uh, contained in the 1974 resolution, which stated that the use of armed forces of one state which are within the territory of another state with the agreement of the receiving state is in fact an act of aggression as well. And therefore Belarus has been targeted by sanctions for this complicity in the crime of aggression. Symbolic sanctions, uh, Belarus was banned from Eurovision and from all major international sport competitions. 
um, it's been uh, de facto suspended from uh, the WTO accession process talks. Hundreds of companies and services have stopped or restricted operations in Belarus. And the EU adopted new packages of targeted sanctions against the Belarusian regime. This had a positive effect in the sense that it probably deterred Lukashenko from crossing the red line and sending troops to fight Russia's war against Ukrainians. But Russia is, as usual, expecting more from its Belarusian ally. From Russian perspective, the role that Belarus could play is twofold. From an operational strategic point of view, the Belarusian army is already seen as part of the Russian armed forces. Uh, where it could play a strategic role would be to the north or to the south. First, the troop presence in Belarus is critical for if Russia considered bridging the Suvauki gap, which is this land corridor between Poland and Lithuania, which uh, separates Belarus from Kaliningrad. It's 90 kilometers or so corridor that was identified by NATO uh, several years ago as a, a highly vulnerable terrain, um, because it is relevant to the scenario in which Russia would attack the Baltic states, either by conventional means or by a fifth column methods as it did in Crimea and Donbass, and if Russia was to take control of this uh, strip of land, it could isolate the Baltic states from the rest of NATO. This scenario has got uh, less likely, of course, especially after Finland and Sweden uh, are due to join NATO. And second, should uh, Russia wish to expand control over to Moldova, it could use, again, Belarusian territory as a springboard to connect with Transnistria over Ukrainian territory. Again, this is all the vision that, um, that Russia has for Belarus's role in its war. Uh, the reality on the ground seems to uh, 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 indicate that it is uh, quite unlikely, at least for the time being. Uh, why does Belarus refrain from stepping up its support uh, to Russia's war? First, I think that Lukashenko contended that Russia is not winning it and that the war is dragging on. He even said it uh, officially in, a, in, a, in an interview. So he doesn't really want to join a sinking boat, uh, being too, all too aware that he too could end up in The Hague. He knows it would mean the end of Belarus's formal sovereignty, which he is not ready to give up just yet, uh, because his army would de facto fight under Russian command. He knows also that his army is under-trained, understaffed, and under-equipped. It has no combat experience. It would suffer heavy human and equipment losses, as well as a high risk of defection, and conscription is always a problem in Belarus. And in fact, since February, hundreds of young men have fled the country for fear of mass mobilization and being forced to fight against Ukrainians. Both he and Putin know that there is a high risk of Belarusian soldiers actually shifting sides and joining Ukrainian armed forces or territorial defense. <clears throat> and in general, Lukashenko knows that he, its army lacks motivation to fight, uh, and especially against Ukrainians, which are seen as a brotherly nation with which Belarus has an interest in, in keeping good neighborly relations. So he's walking a, a, a thin line here. Moreover, he's aware that public opinion is in majority against the war. Uh, according to Chatham House surveys, uh, there is a continuous decline in support for Russia, for the notion of Belarus-Russia Belarus integration and for uh, the war in Ukraine. Before the war, 56% of those polled considered that Belarus should remain neutral in the conflict, and 80% were against Belarusian conscripts taking part in it. The following month, it appeared that only 16% uh, approved of letting Russia use Belarus territory against Ukraine, and 3% that Belarusian troops would engage in the war. Uh, moreover, there is evidence that uh, many volunteers have joined the Ukrainian side uh, that were dissidents who actually had fled to Ukraine over the past years and joined and formed the Kalinovsky Battalion, as well as, as Belarusians from all over the world who came to Ukraine to fight against Russians. There are also sabotage operations against railway connectors uh, to slow down Russian supply chains uh, for the war. Many of these um, trade unionists, unionists and, and, and uh, workers from the Belarusian railways were arrested and they are being treated as terrorists. 
And I can only but stress that uh, two days ago, the criminal code of Belarus has been amended to expand the application of death penalty to those intending or planning to commit a terrorist act. I believe though that it will have a deterrence effect and will not be implemented because the goal is mostly to ensure that Russia does not take care of these saboteurs itself. Um, how to break the deadlock? Of course, Belarus is trying, Lukashenko is trying um, to break it. And there are signs that the regime is trying to mend the burnt bridges uh, with the West by reaching out to Western partners, not to the EU as such, only selected member states actually received a, a letter that was uh, leaked uh, to the press, uh, arguing for uh, dialogue to be resumed, sanctions to be lifted, etc. Uh, he's obviously trying to sell in a positive light the fact that um, uh, Belarus did not formally join the war and that it could contribute even to, to peace talks. And indeed, in early stages, negotiations were held on Belarusian soil, but they have moved to, to Istanbul and stalled since then, as we know. Um, this courting strategy has very little appeal among Western diplomats who consider that he lost all agency and that he has little to offer in exchange especially no guarantees that if he manages to push Russian troops out of his territory, they won't return overnight. And especially as he keeps asking Russia to leave behind the military equipment that he has been begging for for ages, the S-400 missiles. Uh, moreover, there are way too many political prisoners nowadays, over 1,000, and no chance to undo the repression that has been step stepped up in Belarus over the past two years. At this stage, loosening the screws, liberating these prisoners would undermine his position in, uh, in domestically and amount to cutting the branch he is sitting on, which is uh, one of um, um, repression. Um, <clears throat> moreover, it should be reminded that um, Lukashenko is not even considered as legitimate president by many countries. Uh, France, the US, Lithuania, several others have no more ambassador in Minsk because they refuse to present their credentials to Lukashenko, and um, when they even do, uh, so, so nobody would today would, would uh, want to talk with Mr. Lukashenko and they will certainly not call him Mr. President. So in conclusion, <clears throat> uh, as usual, what can we do? The EU is in a deadlock too, because even if it did not recognize Lukashenko as president and considers him as an usurpator inste in, instead, uh, it did not formally recognize his challenger and the current leader of the opposition in exile as president-elect. It would be a delicate, delicate step to take at this stage, recognizes Mrs. Tsikhanovskaya as president, given that one cannot at the same time um, consider election results as falsified without tangible proofs because there were actually no OSC observers to, to monitor the, the, the vote in 2020. And at the same time, proclaim a participant in these elections as a winner. There are precedents, however, and we have seen in the case of uh, Venezuela, for example. And the EU, among others, has given at least the symbolic recognition to Mrs. Tsikhanovska, inviting her, or oh, she's been touring the world and meeting in, in uh, less than uh, uh, two years, way more than, than uh, Mr. Lukashenko ever did in his position as uh, president for 26 years. But the issue of Belarus having a government in exile is not new. And in fact, the, the Rada, which was established in 1918, is the longest living case in the world of a government in exile. So I believe that if Putin lost the war and uh, had to retreat, uh, that could give a renewed impetus to the domestic opposition inside Belarus proper, even inside the bureaucracy, inside the military, prompting a palace or military coup. And um, in a context of economic collapse, which Russia will not avoid anyway, there could be a critical mass of protesters inside Belarus to raise up against Lukashenko because he did not protect them from this war and from the sanctions and the economic consequences that they will bear for, um, for uh, simple citizens. Um, of course, this could only be achieved and this could only achieve positive change in Belarus, regime change, I mean, uh, if at the same time there is a stronger carrier of sovereignty outside of the country encapsulated in this government of, in exile around Mrs. Tsikhanovskaya. So in other words, 
when the time is ripe, and this will mostly depend on the course of the war on the ground and whether Russia indeed collapse military or economically, which is still far from certain, the EU should consider taking strong steps in the form of recognizing this government in exile. And one option at this stage already is to grant the status of citizens of free Belarus to the hundreds of thousands of Belarusians who have been in forced exile for almost two years now as a result of repression in the country. So after this probably a bit provocative conclusion, I uh, end here and, and welcome uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you.